Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is John Horn of the Los Angeles Times. I'm going to lead a little bit of the Q&A, and then we'll turn it over to you guys. Um, so I'd like to introduce the cast and filmmakers behind August Osage County, starting with Dermot Mulrooney. Go all the way across. Juliette Lewis. Julianne Nicholson. Julia Roberts. Meryl Streep. John Wells. Margot Martindale. Chris Cooper. Abigail Breslin. And Tracy Letts. Uh, I'm going to start with John Wells. Um, people who have seen the play will probably remember that it's a, a three-story set. The scenic design kind of reinforces the claustrophobia of this family kind of living atop each other. In adapting a play and, and bringing it somewhat, taken in a cinematic direction, how do you retain that, the claustrophobia that is so inherently theatrical to the play and still open it up a little bit? You know, um, I'm from the plains outside of, uh, of Denver in Colorado. And uh, one of the things that happens is that you're in homes. We found this beautiful home that we purchased in, uh, in Osage County in Oklahoma. One of the things that happens is there's actually, it's quite claustrophobic to be out in these small, in these small homes in the middle of these vast uh, landscapes. And so what we're trying to do is to give that same sense of having this uh, very claustrophobic place where everyone is, is uh, stuck uh, and a long ways away from everything else and to try and do that to, to match the necessary sort of claustrophobia of the home. Uh, so we spent a lot of time talking about that, actually. Uh, Tracy, in talking to John about how you're going to adapt this play, it's obviously a three-act play, and it has to be squeezed a little bit. Do you look at scenes? Do you look at favorite dialogue? Do you look at overall thematic arcs in terms of trying to compress the play down into screenplay form? What are the conversations you have about what stays and what goes? We try not to begin the conversation with just talking about what can we lose, where can we cut. We, we try to begin a more general conversation about how can we tell this story uh, with pictures. Uh, where will pictures substitute for words without losing so many of the things that made August Osage County uh, August Osage County to begin with, uh, so much of the language uh, and a lot of the humor. So we just tried to find a, a a visual language, a visual flow and dynamism to the piece, a, a cinematic version of the story. And then eventually you get to the point where you are doing some, some, some painful cutting, losing, losing some material that I was loath to lose, but uh, uh, that's, that's the process. Were there specific scenes that you clung on to until the very end, or scenes that were shot that didn't make the finished film? Sure, yeah, there, and there always are, I, I think, uh, in, in any film, that that's the, those are some of the painful decisions you're making in the eleventh hour in the editing room. So yeah, there were specific things that I that I hated to lose. But the truth is that the play exists as the play and always will. And the movie is its own very distinct, uh, self-contained animal. And I think uh, successful in that regard. I have a question for uh, Chris. Chris, we know what it's like to, to watch Merrill act. As an actor, what is it like to watch Merrill act? And what are those, especially the, the big kind of showy scenes when you're in a room with an actor like Meryl Streep, how is it for other actors to work? He's the only one I've done a nude scene with. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Lucky so Chris. Far. So far. <laughs> and she's a, she's a master at it all. <laughs> no. But I, I mean that sincerely. We, uh, we do our best to act along with her, but um, I keep having this um, fantasy of in, but this is, but this is the setting where you, where you talk about the whole process, and, and I thought in terms of like a Charlie Rose or whatever, where you talk about um, acting and feel like you can open up about it. Um, to say that the viewer, that watches her work um, really has, still has no idea 
the, um, the talent um, that we observe per take because she brings such variety. Um, and with this character, say at the dinner table scene, she'll, she'll bring, of course, her drug addled side, but there's also the, I could give a shit about what's going on, you know, at this dinner table. Or she'll bring the mean, mean underbelly and the confrontation, and she'll just mix it up. And we never know what's coming at us, and that keeps us on our toes. So it's a, it's a great lesson. Um, I'm, this is the second time I've worked with her, and I'm still learning, you know. <laughs> Julia? You'll <We'll> never learn. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, the uh, Weston sisters, I, I assumed before a family can become dysfunctional, they have to become functional. Uh, and in the, in, the, in, this, in the case of this movie, in the weeks leading up to filming, was there, are, is there anything that you guys could do as actors to kind of prepare for, for this movie in terms of the relationships that are either not really delineated in the play or the relationships that you want to play at in the movie before you actually start production? Uh, specifically with my sisters here? Correct. To my left? Yes, <laughs> those. Well, your name had to start with a J-U-L. You were going to be a Weston sister. Um, we spent a lot of time together and, and um, getting to know each other. And we didn't know each other at all when it started. And by the time we began filming, I felt um, very familiar and entangled with these girls in a way that seemed correct for sisters and had made just enough um, happy experiences with them and had a, a couple of appropriate sisterly, like, really, that's what you're wearing kind of moments where I felt like it was all going to fall into place. Um, did you guys have a chance? I mean, I think I've heard stories about uh, where you all were living. Margo, maybe you can talk about this. Did you have some sort of compound uh, out on the plains before <laughs> filming started? Yes, Miss Streep had it built. It's a beautiful compound. <laughs> <laughs> we lived in townhouses, all cook, hooked together, and we did a lot of socializing together. We actually became a family together. We watched television together, cooked together, ate together, uh, laughed, you know, worried about Hurricane Sandy together. It was, a, it was an incredible experience that really made for the perfect environment for this ensemble of a actors to do this beautiful screenplay. Did you make the casserole? I, I made a, a chicken spaghetti casserole. <laughs> you did not drop it? I actually left one for John Wells in the refrigerator when I left. You did? <laughs> uh, Julianne, I'm going to talk a little bit about the language of the, of, of the film. There's an inherent theatricality to any play, um, and there's an inha inherent uh, um, melodrama almost to what Tracy has written. When you're going from stage uh, to screen, is there a, a different kind of style of acting you do? Because the language is so specific. And in your conversations with John about how this language is going to work, what are the conversations that you have with your director? First of all, I would like to say that I feel like I have the opportunity right now to either win or lose a large sum of money. <laughs> I'm so nervous. Um, <laughs> So, um, what was the I'd rather talk about where we lived, but I will talk about the language. Um, I, f I f do you approach it differently? I mean, I, I think you probably do, but really, I mean, just in terms of in a theater, you have to fill the space in a different way, but I, I think approaching it, you just want to honor the words that are there and be as honest and, and in this case, as present as you can be to the people who are around you, um, which just ups, in this case, just ups your game tremendously. And Tracy's writing is, is very particular and so beautiful and actually has quite a rhythm to it. So there was no improvising because we didn't want to mess with that rhythm. And it feels and sounds very naturalistic, but it's, it's quite precise and exciting to be given. There's a lot of freedom, actually, when you know you can't stray from the lines. So it was a, it was a thrill to be able to do that. Uh, Meryl, there's so many different ways you could read Violet about, about is, is she damaged, is she spiteful, uh, is she confused, is she insecure? 
I'm curious to you, do you kind of decide pretty early on what her, what, her pers what her motivations are? Do you have conversations with John and Tracy? Because it's a character that can be played so many different ways in so many different directions. We, well, John and I um, emailed a little bit in preparation for this. And I would say my, my biggest, one of the things that really interested me was where she was at any given point in the cycle of pain and pain relief. Uh, where she was on her painkiller cycle, you know, in any given scene. And since we were shooting out of order, I sort of had to map, map that in a way, um, just so I'd know what level of attention or inattention I could bring to my fellow actors. <laughs> and um, that was, um, because, you know, I think you, as an actor, you're supposed to want to go into the house of pain over and over and over and over again. But really, it's, it's not something that you, um, that's fun. And I, I resisted doing this initially, the, the part, because of that. I just thought, ugh. <laughs> and um, because on so many levels, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, Violet is enraged and or in pain or um, drugged, you know, at any <laughs> given time. And so that was the, that was the main thing that I was. Uh, I didn't doubt that I would uh, go um, and figure out how much. Anyway, no, I, I, don't, I don't want to talk about this. I hate it, hate it, hate it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, next question. Okay. It was my idea to live in the condo villages behind it was. the Toyota dealership, yes. Why was that your George idea? George Clooney opted out of our living accommodations. Didn't he now? Yes, he did. He's so important. <laughs> um, but... The rest of us, oh, also John didn't join us. But, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I understand that. It was right there by the Yeah, chilling, yeah, so you, he, he it, lived you know. where we had rushes, so that was a bad thing, too. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Abigail. Abigail, Jean is somebody who is probably getting the worst of it. Uh, her parents are, their marriage is ending, her <laughs> grandfather has died. Um, she has this creepy guy at the end making inappropriate advances. I'm sorry. We have this creepy character played by this guy at the end, making inappropriate advances on her. Um, I'm curious about reading that part and about your interest in playing Jean and how, what's going through her life at this, and she's going through adolescence. Everything on top of everything. Right. Um, well, um, I read it and um, I kind of, immediately felt really attached to her for some reason. And I think it's because, um, like, I was, okay, I'm 17, so I wasn't 14 that long ago. And so I kind of know that age is like a really weird age, because you're not really like a kid, but you're not really accepted as being a teenager yet. So it's kind of complicated. And um, she does have a lot going on because she's trying to be this, like, act like she doesn't care about anything and kind of just like, oh, I don't want to be here. And <coughs> like, she's really tough, but she's not really at all. And she's kind of just very, I mean, that's how I read it. And I think towards the end is when she's kind of realizing that like, oh my God, I don't want to become like any of these people at all. And so <laughs> it's kind of, there's a little bit of hope for her that she could maybe be slightly <laughs> normal. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to everybody else. Yeah. Uh, Juliet, there's a, there's a line your character has toward the end of the play, end of the movie as well. Um, I'm not proud of things you'll never know about. Are those things that you want to know about as an actor, about what those things are that you're not proud about, or is it important to know? I don't, uh, let's see, that would be more of an intellectual approach. I guess some people write diaries or backstories. 
I liken it to channeling. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> <laughs> kind of not kidding, but um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I I feel like this. Um, when I first read this script, I immediately understood. My heart just swelled, and I completely understood everything about Karen. And so, um, what one is not proud of is all relative. You know, it, what she's not proud of um, could be nothing to somebody else. And then, you know, so people's pain is so individual. But the but. But I feel like as an actor, um, to be in touch with all those emotions of shame, um, anger, uh, um, your lust, your joy, your, you know, you, you, those are sort of like your, your watercolors. And um, I just, I don't know, I have to validate Tracy and John while we're here because first of all, John gave us this beautiful environment to pour out what we needed to, uh, to to create these roles. And he always, he was A, very consistent as a temperament, like really lovely and easy to work with and perform with. He gave us a rehearsal period, which is really a luxury on film these days. Um, and then Tracy lets his writing, I just was so floored, because you've seen the state of cinema today. Um, it's <laughs> so. <laughs> this is something that comes maybe once in a while. But his characters are uh, written so strong; they just leap off the page. I don't know what your question was, <laughs> but you answered it. I understood Karen. Oh, and her illusion and the denial and all those things. I mean, I'm always struggling between the, being a realist or an idealist or. Somebody said you could be both, uh, but it depends, but anyway. <laughs> Dermot, um, no offense to the creepy guy character you play. N none taken. Your, uh, your creepy guy has to take a phone call in the middle of the dinner scene. Yeah. But you, this is a, uh, a scene that goes on for four days over filming, correct? Yeah. Uh, I just want to hear a little bit about what it was like to be in that scene and what it was like to do that scene for four days. They're laughing at me. I, I, I don't think that's cool, you guys. Come on, seriously, I have to answer a question. Um, those four days on this set were the most memorable I've had in 28 years of film acting. No offense, Julia. Um, uh, oh, damn it. Come to think of it, I hadn't put that together before. Uh, one of some of the most, however you want to correct that. Um, <laughs> But you can see why. This is a famous play already, from, a famous scene from the play. And this character that I was truly gifted with, John, thank you so much, so much, to be here with all of you today. I'm almost choking up uh, with the privilege and the honor that I feel. Um, so to tell you about that scene would be to tell you how, uh, how you're supposed to make movies. I mean, that's how it's supposed to be done. You're supposed to do it straight through. You're supposed to do it with everybody there. You're supposed to do it in the real place, in the real state, in the real town. So all of that was provided for us with these words that um, obviously will stand um, for centuries. Um, and now that we've filmed it, can you imagine? People long after we're dead will be enjoying um, Tracy's words. So um, I felt all of that going into this. And then just as we step into the house, of course, you, you leave it on that porch. And you come in, my character, of course, I'm just entering happy-go-lucky here. I'm supporting my, uh, well, fourth wife, but, you know, I'm really dedicated to her. It was um, two. Oh. Well, I know, well, there was the, it was an old or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but so I had that uh, delicious seat at that table where I'm the one who nobody knows and who knows no one. Um, so I think you have glimpses in that scene of it reveal, being revealed to Steve what he actually walked into <laughs> and how he's gonna deal with it. And obviously, the way this story turns, um, he doesn't deal with it very well and makes inadvisable choices. Um, or, however you read that, he wasn't able to um, suppress his urges um, and those are issues that whole films can be devoted to, whole books, whole uh, classes in college. So 
Um, I was thrilled to have one of the ugly people in this play. I was, I was thrilled to play one of, one of several um, and uh, felt in good company in terms of that. Before we turn over to questions for the audience, I want to ask the, uh, Julia, Julianne and uh, Julia. It's hard to do that three in a row. Um, this is a, a story about a family coming together, but it's really a story about a family breaking apart and going away. I'm curious, as you see each of your characters, where are you going at the end of the story? Where are you off to? What's in your future? Julia, I'm looking at you because I think you have an answer. You're looking at me? Yes. I always look like I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Better than the other way around. I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> I'm getting in that truck and I'm, or maybe Disney World. I, I don't want to say where I'm going because I think that more than any person in the piece, um, Barbara, in the end, it's, I think, everyone that I've spoken to um, says, oh, I know exactly what she's thinking and exactly where she's going and what she's going to do, and I haven't heard the same answer twice. Fantastic. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Fantastic. What about Ivy? Uh, I don't know where Ivy's going. I mean, I don't think Ivy knows where she's going when she's driving away. She's just leaving, and she'll maybe tomorrow she'll figure out where she's going. Karen's going to Florida, right? Belize? Belize. Now I'm literally thinking of that last question you said. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, yeah, I do remember what she felt bad about. I did okay. think about it. <laughs> If that's a better answer, go to it. Where is she going? Karen, re to me, represents so many people uh, in, in life and women and people I've met. She could go one of two ways. They're going to fight on the trip, no doubt. Mm -hmm. He might hit on the waitress. Um, and then he might buy her a present. And then they might fall back into it. I don't know. She might yo-yo about. Or she might have an epiphany. She's not gonna have an epiphany. I wish she would. She could, maybe at 55. <laughs> That's a good answer. Who wants to start uh, questions from the audience? And I think they're microphones, so wait for microphones. They're gonna oh, right argue here. on the trip. Oh, they're gonna have a break. Could you, could you talk about surprises in um, your family members acting? When you read the script, you probably had an idea of how these family members would, what, would they, what they would be like. How did then, when it all came about, what were some of the greatest surprises? And for Meryl Streep, what's your relationship to tropical birds? <laughs> your relationship with tropical birds? Was that the question? Yeah. Okay. I get it. I get it. Julia it's my line. It. I get it. I totally get it. Julia, maybe you can answer for Meryl. I totally get it. And you know what? I haven't heard that question yet, and I've heard about 10,000 questions, so well done you. <laughs> Meryl, what is your relationship with tropical birds? Ah! <laughs> ah! Ah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what? I, this is just such, oh, always such an interesting process. <laughs> But to the act, the sisters want to talk about your, your first part of your question. Then. The who? With, yes. Sisters. What's the question? Yeah. Julianne. Yeah. I, I was surprised by, I don't have specifics, but I was surprised by people every day. First of all, just seeing Violet for the first time mm -hmm. chilled me to my core. I was so surprised. I had no idea. I mean, I guess I had a... a a picture, but I couldn't describe what that was, but I was surprised by Violet when she, just physically when she walked in the room. And that was the, the joy about being there every day. You never knew what was gonna happen when, and it was a thrill every day to see what this amazing cast came up with and how honest and true and moving and, and great it was. Chris, did you have something you wanted to add? No? Tropical birds? Yeah. That, you know. <laughs> Um, next question, uh, who's got the microphone? You've got the microphone, go ahead. Hello. Oh, and tell me who it's directed to as well. Okay. I get it. Uh, well, for those of you who have worked together before, what was it like coming together again in these profoundly different roles? From the last project. Me? Well, whoever has worked together, so uh, there's a uh, whole group. I can group. talk about Chris, because yep. we've worked together. I've worked with Margot before. 
and um, but never, n never as in such a substantial way. And I just um, every single the thing about this piece is that, and I wish Ewan were here and Benedict and you know because you we were all absolutely integral to this thing working or not. And as uh, parts are singled out, like Chris's character, I felt was someone that he would imbue, and, I, and he did, with his enormous humanity and um, compassion. And I knew the audience would love him. And I knew that they would hate me in, in equal measure. And that is the story. It's ba a balance. It's a balance of all these characters that you're aware as you're watching the play that you, you turn your eyes from one to the other but it, it, it's all affected. Each person's, what you give, you get. What you get, you give. And it only works if we're, we're together. And we were so together, that's all. This person, when, when we ha have a speech in the thing about that she has my back, I really always, always, always felt that. And, and you know, because she made me feel that way. So I feel like, you know, we're very lucky to have each other. Yeah, in, in uh, making this thing. And that does have to do with the way John set it up. Because John set, how you put to a, a family together, you don't get a vote in who's in your family. But John, was like God, and he put, you know, he put this group of people together and thought, oh, this will get messy, and it was really that was masterfully done. Well, I would like to speak about Dermot for a moment, um, and say that it was Dermot and I have been friends since my best friend's wedding. We became great pals then, and. When he called me that he had gotten a part in this, we squealed like, like little girls, yeah. both of us, and <laughs> were so excited for each other and to be back together. And without everybody, but in particular Dermot, who even when he had a day off would come run lines with me before I went to work at six o'clock in the morning, for a, traded for a good cup of coffee. Yeah, her coffee was a lot better than mine. Exceptionally good so. coffee. <laughs> Um, and it was just the whole time feeling so supported by my old friend. Uh, he would come to work and, and watch scenes that I was in and just kind of like support me in that way. It was uh, beautiful to have each other in that way, especially when we're all away from our families and forging new relationships. It was just nice to have um, my rock steady there. Yeah. It was great. You know, I'd start my day with a coffee with Julia, and then I'd be able to, because I'd know her and love her, we would uh, whisper in each other's ear on the set, and then I'd um, kiss her goodnight. Can you imagine a day like that? <laughs> that really is not going to go well in print, I don't think. Don't <laughs> no, you know, on, on the cheek. <laughs> okay. That's, That's what I mean. Uh, you know. Let's just get that straight, people. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Two happy one. marriages, a whole on lot of kids On the cheek, here. on the cheek, people. <laughs> Let's go over here to you, right there. Yes, there we go. Uh, behind you, behind, there you oh. go. Oh, that was, ooh, ooh. That was really critically cold. Yeah, go ahead. we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you. Hi, because of the, the strong mother-daughter bond, although dysfunctional, I wanted to know what, if, Meryl and Julia did to kind of get into that and how difficult it was to shake it off at the end of a very emotional scene or the dinner scenes or those very emotional days. How did we do it? Uh, we ate a lot. We hugged a lot. <laughs> we hugged a lot. I, I mean, I always had to 
look her right in the eye before we parted ways to make sure we're all good. It's, that was yeah. just, we're kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't the most joyous uh, experience from my point of view. It was hard to feel that way about everybody. <laughs> Except you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was really, that was um, miserable and it was also <sighs> during the election and um, also the television is very odd out there. <clears throat> I'm not going to get into that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was so, you can feel very disembodied in, the, in that world, so it was important to make a connection beyond, outside the set. Also, I was smoking nonstop, which is, really makes you feel shitty. Let's go uh, to the front row here in the blue sweater. The uh, movie touches on so many different topics. Is there any, whether it's secrets or substance abuse, is there any one particular topic that touched you very, you know, emotionally? Chris? Yeah, um, I had to, I had to particularly zero in on this idea of um, unconditional love for um, your child when people don't see that child as whole, you know. So that was something that was really visceral and something to, you know, uh, life experience that you can bring, you know, to your work. That was a big one. Anybody else? Make Margot talk. Margot, Margo, yes. she's never been yeah. this quiet in yeah, the history she's of the never world. Shut up, usually. <laughs> it's very early for me. <laughs> <laughs> I found the uh, part of being so critical and uh, painfully brutal to my son the hardest, and it also, I mean, I could see a little bit of that in myself, and it, it, it made me feel ashamed. So that's, that's, I think that was the hardest part for me, is how incredibly cruel I was. And my dear sister wasn't cruel at all, was she? <laughs> <laughs> for me, for me, one of the most, um, upsetting scenes we, we shot very early on, um, and it was with uh, Sam Shepard, who's a person, <clears throat> a writer I really have always admired, and admired him as an actor. And um, to look at him close up and see his loathing of me, uh, that was, you know, that was that was really hard because I, you know, you 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 get old, you know, you look you, you look old, you're old, and um, <laughs> and you still think that maybe there's a spark of love from this person who's gone through everything, and to look in his eyes and realize that he'd rather be dead than looking at me, ooh. That was brutal. That was like, that sort of set the tone for, you know, where my own uh, dealing with his death and everything afterwards. Um, let's get a question for Tracy as well. We have the author of this work sitting right here. So maybe if you have a question for Tracy, I just want the guy who created the story to be included. Go ahead. This is uh, very specific. I wonder if uh, I was working with Gustavo Santaolalla in the music, if uh, either Tracy or, or John had back and forth with him to create the atmosphere, or if it was just a work for hire. 
Uh, and also, I wonder if anybody could also comment uh, about how did you manage to, to be so serious during the scene that Chris is blessing the food? <laughs> well, I can speak to Gustavo, uh, who is our wonderful composer. Um, Gustavo came in, we had finished the film, uh, roughly finished the film, and he came in and saw it and was uh, very moved by it. He doesn't work often because of that. He uh, has a very busy touring schedule as a musician. Um, and we had used a number of his pieces in the temp score and we called him to ask him if he would do it and uh, I was very surprised that he responded that he would because he doesn't do film very often. Um, and then I had the great pleasure of spending, he, he has a studio that's in the Echo Park area of Los Angeles and one of my great pleasures through the whole process was spending about two weeks over there watching him create the music and, uh, and play and uh, those are to me are always uh, the gift at the end of the entire post-production process, which can be very grueling, is to, is to actually then get to work with the musicians. We recorded the score then at Abbey Road in London, and to be on the sound stages with Gustavo and uh, 100 members of the, mostly from the London Philharmonic, it's, it's, uh, those are just wonderful, wonderful moments. He was integral to what we were doing. No. He came in after we were finished with the shooting. Uh, right here in the front. Wait for the mic. Um, well, I'll give a question for Tracy and John to talk about the process of transferring and transforming this from the play to the film because there's some distinct differences. And then I'd like to ask uh, any or all of you on the stage that, to talk about, this is a very weighty play, very weighty movie, and you've done a lot of weighty roles. How does this fit into the scale of, uh, particularly Merrill, uh, fit into the scale of those roles that have been so heavy and deal with such emotional transition? But I'd like to first hear from you guys. Well, I can tell you that, uh, you know, it was very important to, to us that we try to preserve the, the humor of the piece. You know, I always sort of felt that, the, in some ways, the secret of the success of August Osage County was the humor, and that quite often when uh, plays are turned into films, the, the humor is lost. Uh, e even when the films are still good, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? I, I've done both of these plays and they're outrageous comedies, but uh, the, the movies become a, 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 a gloomier uh, affair and, and they lose a lot of the humor. And I said to John early on, if that happens with August, we're dead because you hear everybody up here talking about the pain that a lot of these characters are going through and all that stuff is very real, it's very true, it's what the piece is about. But it, that's, uh, while it may be difficult uh, for uh, the actors to live in, uh, the truth is it would be impossible for an audience to watch were it not for the humor. The humor is really what sort of hooks you in, and as long as you're laughing, you're listening. And so John and I were, uh, both of us, uh, very assiduous about making sure that we did not, uh, we didn't talk about it in terms of the laughs, but we talked about uh, maintaining a certain uh, buoyancy and rhythm, I think, that would still allow for audience laughter. And as I've seen it now a couple of times uh, with uh, large auditoriums of audience, it seems to be working. So I'm, I'm happy about that. that Merrill, does it, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say, that was my real fear <clears throat> when we first started screening the film would be, would anybody laugh? And the tremendous relief when they start to is... Uh, it's great, and, and in every, uh, one of the things, Jean Demanian, I think maybe here is one of our producers and, and produced uh, the play on Broadway, and she gave me access to the, uh, to the videoed version of the play, which is in the archives at Lincoln Center, and I sat there with a copy of the play and a highlighter, and I highlighted before Tracy and I first met every single laugh in the Broadway play, and in our cutting of the piece, we literally only cut two spots that had laughs. We saved every, single laugh so that and for exactly that reason the humor is what <clears throat> allows the characters to uh, to progress and it's the way that in my family the tension was always dealt with I think in many families that someone's always trying to to undermine the tension by saying something that's sort of funny but not necessarily funny because it's actually a barb it's actually getting at somebody else uh, but you laugh and then you try to figure out what you're going to say next to get them back that will also be funny. Yeah, Meryl, do you want to talk? Does that, that humor kind of help you in terms of dealing with the weightiness of the role? Um, uh, well, every, uh, every character I've 
ever played is about five, six, and weighs about the same, you know, <laughs> in terms of weightiness. Um, uh, I, I was trying to look sicker and thinner than I actually am, um, but I felt, mm, you know, it's just, I don't think about things that way. To me, one of the most excruciatingly funny pieces in this is the prayer, which is honestly, beautifully, earnestly given to the best of his ability. <laughs> and it is, it reminded me of church when I used to go to church and there was no laughter like the laughter that you could, if you could get the whole pew going like that. <laughs> I mean, to me things, you know, you talk about the, the, the humor is born out of pain. Yeah, but you do want your laughs and every single one of these actors here came to the first reading with the copy of the original play in their back pocket with their laughs that had been cut, you know, because I know. I, I spoke to you privately. We did. Yes, about things that I really didn't want to lose. And um, so you, you have a sense of, you know, what's going to buy you the attention of people, otherwise they want to kill themselves, you know, with this family. But it is so, it's like, you come together with your friends and you say, I had Thanksgiving, I have to tell you what my mother said. Oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe it. And you tell the story that was not funny when you were there, but in the telling, it's fabulous. And that's how you transform your life because if you can't laugh about this stuff. We have time for one more question. I'll go way over there. Uh, you guys can fight among yourselves, the three of you. I've got it in the red, the person in the red in the middle. Thank you. Last question. This is for Margot and Chris. Great. Um, it was really fun for me to see you play a couple because I watched you on stage in Kentucky 30 plus years ago at Actors Theatre of Louisville. And both of you. But what I can't remember because I saw so many plays there, did you ever work on stage together, either there or elsewhere? One time in The Hostages. No, The Informer. Yeah, the Informer. Yeah. The Informer. We all had Irish accents in Kentucky. I can't even do one. I, it's ridiculous. It still sounds like East Texas. It sounds just like East Texas. Everything I do, unfortunately. Uh, uh, may, have been, may have been on stage, but I don't think we traded, traded any lines together. We didn't trade any lines no. except in whispers on stage to try to make me laugh. That's <laughs> well, yeah, it was a great to be... Married to Chris Cooper. Mm. <laughs> I adored working with us, and I, I have been waiting, waiting a long, long time to work with Margot. And I keep saying, you know, uh, gosh, she's wor she's working so much now, you know. But she was as talented back then as 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 now, you know. And just can't take my eyes off her. And she's she's doing great. So busy right now. We have to uh, wrap this up, unfortunately. I want to thank Dermot, Juliet, Julianne, Julia, Meryl, John, Margot, Chris, Abigail, and Tracy. Thank you. Thank you.